Over time, I began to see the systemic racism. Tonight, Lakehead University is under fire after an Indigenous woman resigns as Dean of the Faculty of Law. It's going to give people more opportunities to connect and get the support that they need. Making mental health resources easier to access for remote communities in the Yukon. Without the identity as connected to the language, you're nothing. And a story from Mohawk territory on how to keep our languages alive. Good evening, I'm Beverly Andrews. The woman in charge of Nunavut's largest land claims organization was in New York last week. She was visiting the United Nations and got a chance to speak on a subject very close to home, the Inuit language. Ken Driscoll brings us this story from Iqaluit. Aluki Kuturik is president of Nunavut Tungavik, the group that oversees the Nunavut land claim agreement. Last week, Kuturik asked the United Nations for a special recognition for Inuktut, as one of Canada's founding languages. Um, I thought it was very important to raise it at an international forum because Canada is often viewed as a very progressive nation and um, often there's a view that Indigenous peoples in Canada have it much better than other Indigenous peoples around the world. Anuktut is the term that covers all Inuit language. The federal government says they plan to introduce legislation on Indigenous language before the end of their term. Recognition of Inuit language as a founding language is key for her, Kuturik explains. One of the cautions I've had in terms of working towards an Indigenous languages legislation is that um, I don't want it to be something merely symbolic. I don't want the federal government to recognize Indigenous languages only in a symbolic way. For Inuktut to take its place as a founding language, Inuit have work to do as well. As Inuit, we also have a role in making sure that um, we use it more um, openly and more frequently in public spaces. Recognition of Inuktut as a founding language would put it on par with English and French in Nunavut. Right now, the federal government funds French language education at the rate of $8,189 per student annually. Inuktut, just $187 annually. If Inuktut receives the sought-after designation, those numbers could change dramatically. Kent Driscoll, EPTN National News, Echaluit. And we would like to hear what you have to say about this or any other story. Here's how to contact us. Send us an email to news at aptn.ca, like our APTN National News Facebook page, follow us on Twitter at APTN News, or go to our website, aptnnews.ca. Yukon communities will have better access to mental health care. Previously, people had to go to Whitehorse or further south for assistance, but now four mental health hubs are opening up in the territory. As Shirley McLean reports, the hubs will be a one-stop shop for people in crisis. It's a grand opening for the village of Carmax's mental hub. Carmax is about 180 kilometers from Whitehorse. It's one of four hubs to open in the territory. This hub will serve the communities of Pelly Crossing, Faro, and Ross River. In order for us to thrive, we need to you know, address the issues of the past but continue to move forward and, and seek successes. Minister of Health and Social Services Pauline Frost says mental health wellness in the communities need to tie into the Indigenous laws of the land for the people who live there. What we've seen historically, everything is put, put into a white centric model or an urban-centric model. Nothing is put back into the communities. We've not once spoke about land-based healing and land-based initiatives in our communities. The First Nations have been pushing for that for a lot of years and never really got the support. The idea behind the hubs is to allow people to stay closer to home by streamlining three separate programs into a single access point to seek out professional help with addictions, mental health services and therapeutic services for children and youth without having to travel to Yukon's capital city of Whitehorse. Nathan Schultz, a local Yukoner, has been hired as one of the clinical counsellors. It's a whole different world when you only have a counselor coming out every two weeks, but I'm going to be here every day. My door is going to be open every day. It's going to give people more opportunities to connect and get the support that they need. The CARMEX office will be staffed with mental wellness and substance abuse counselors, a clinical counselor, a mental health nurse, and two child and youth counselors. Three other community hubs are now open in Haines Junction, Watson Lake, and Dawson City.
We have 78% of the children that are in our care are indigenous. And so we really have to put the supports and wraparound supports in rural Yukon. And that has never happened before. If clients need something more like having to go to the hospital or receive intensive treatment, the hub will be a place where their needs can be assessed before sending them to points further south. Shirley McLean, EPTN National News, Whitehorse. Historically, treaty Indians were exempt from paying taxes. So a few Winnipeggers thought they had struck gold last week when a do local Dollarama store decided not to charge sales tax if a secure Indian status card was shown at the till. It started when the Citizens Bridge Organization shared a post that said, you can now present it at Dollarama to have tax exempt on your purchase. The post was shared over 900 times. APTN was able to confirm exemptions did take place, but the do Dollarama stopped it a few days later after a call from head office. The discount store chain hasn't said why, and as of this afternoon, the social media post was still up. Indigenous leaders in Northern Ontario say Lakehead University has to address its racism problem. Yesterday, a number of leaders held a news conference after APTN News posted a story about Angelique Eaglewoman, the dean of the university's law school. They say they are frustrated and disappointed that she felt she needed to resign because of racism and apathy at the school. To date, the university in Thunder Bay has refused to comment. But late this afternoon, they held a news conference. We'll get to that in a moment, but first, here's Willow Fiddler with the problems at Lakehead. Angelique Eaglewoman announced her resignation last month. Now, First Nations and Métis leaders are standing behind her in support. Uh, I speak strongly for, and I'm very disheartened that uh, we have lost a very strong First Nation uh, woman uh, leaving the organization here today and uh, we'll be very vocal to the Board of Governors on, on addressing this issue coming forward. In a letter to the Aboriginal Advisory Committee in March, Eagle Woman said she had been the victim of systemic discrimination because she's Indigenous and a woman. From the very beginning of my tenure as a Dean, I felt that there were um, certain staff and faculty members that were very resistant and over time I began to see the systemic racism and call for cultural competency training within the faculty of law um, and then I began to experience from the senior administration that they didn't see it the same way and they weren't going to support me in those efforts. Eagle Woman was appointed Dean of the Law School in 2016. She said staff and faculty resisted to her efforts of doing things like reaching out to First Nations high school students in Thunder Bay and holding a conference on Indigenous law practices. So in doing those types of things, I was criticized as only focusing on the Indigenous law mandate. And again, that idea that somehow this was an add-on and not a central part of the fabric of the law school. Deputy Grand Chief Derek Fox from Nishnabi Aski Nation says that the Indigenous mandate and its Indigenous partners are the reason the law school exists in the first place. You know, they use that mandate. They use that mandate to get these law schools. They use that mandate to... to um, uh, create these two schools on the basis of uh, First Nations beliefs. And it seems to me that uh, once these schools are created, they want to get rid of those teachings. In a letter to the university's Board of Governors, First Nations and Métis leaders want to ensure that the next dean will be Indigenous and that there is an Indigenous seat on the Board of Governors going forward. Willow Fiddler, APTN National News, Thunder Bay. Willow Fiddler contacted the university to get a comment on this story. Over the last few days, they had refused until today. The administration held a news conference late this afternoon. This is some of what Maura McPherson, interim president and vice chancellor of Lakehead University, had to say. What we acknowledged is that throughout society, systemic racism exists, and uh, um, you know this includes. Of course, despite our efforts, it, it would include Lakehead University. We're not immune to this. Uh, we are committed to understanding systemic racism and ensuring that we're creating an environment that will allow all of our members to flourish. Uh, we will be reaching out to our Indigenous communities and our non-Indigenous communities as well to uh, learn together, to listen, to reflect, and to develop an action plan uh, together.
Uh, we will be announcing an interim dean in the not too distant future. And uh, once we've completed that, we'll be taking the initial steps to start a process for searching for a new dean of the Faculty of Law. After the break, we will talk to the APT and road crew while they were on a pit stop from their travels down the Trans Mountain Pipeline route. But first, tomorrow's weather outlook. Plus 12 in rain in Charlottetown and Halifax. Kujuwag partly cloudy and plus 3. More cloud in Happy Valley Goose Bay at plus 7. Rain in Gas Bay and plus 6. More rain in Montreal and plus 11. Southern Ontario looking mostly sunny. Windsor's at plus 14. North Bay plus 12. Thunder Bay has some cloud at plus 8. Sunny in Sudbury plus 13. Flurries in Thompson and plus 5. Partly cloudy in the Paw and plus 12. Plus 7 with some cloud cover in Barrens River. Brandon also cloudy, plus 17. Saskatchewan is mostly sunny, plus 17 in North Battleford, Regina and Estevan. Uranium City is plus 6. Meadow Lake is plus 16. APTN reporters Tamara Pimital and Lucy Scoli have been driving along the Trans Mountain Pipeline. They've been stopping in indigenous communities along the route between Burnaby, B.C. and Edmonton, Alberta to get a pulse on how people feel about the pipeline expansion. They join us now from Spruce Grove, Alberta. Welcome to Mara and Lucy. Lucy, why did you decide to drive along the pipeline route? So we thought it was really important to talk to members of different Indigenous communities that uh, live along the pipeline route. To date, a lot of the focus and the media attention on this massive $7.4 billion pipeline expansion project has been on the intergovernment squabbling between the Premiers of BC and Alberta and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. So we thought it was really important to uh, visit these communities along the pipeline route and talk to people who will actually be impacted by the pipeline expansion should it go through. And what have you both been hearing from these community members? So we arrived in Burnaby on Friday and there, as soon as we arrived, there were two protesters that were arrested and then we drove about an hour and a half east to Chiam First Nation where the chief is pro-pipeline and he's already signed an agreement with Kinder Morgan and we spoke with uh, one community member there that said not all community members actually agreed to that. So there are some that are quite upset. We also joined in on a salmon ceremony um, for the first salmon catch of the year and a lot of people there did not want to comment on it saying that the pipelines actually divided a lot of their community and caused a lot of tension and we saw that when we were interviewing the chief and we had a lot of security nearby. And then we uh, drove further, maybe 150 kilometers up the highway to this community uh, called Coldwater Indian Band, a uh, community that has not signed a mutual benefit agreement with Kinder Morgan because members there are very concerned about uh, an aquifer. The proposed pipeline route is supposed to cross uh, through their ter territory uh, above the aquifer. And so community members there are really concerned about the health of their main source of drinking water. And Tamara, what else have you learned from this trip? So the interesting thing about this trip is we're, co we're coming into these communities cold. Lucy's based out of the Ottawa Bureau and I'm based out of Calgary, so we don't normally uh, report in these areas. So really what we're doing is we're driving through, we're observing, we've reached out to people on social media, we've been speaking to anyone who's reached out to us. We, don't, we haven't been interviewing people who you normally see on, on, on TV or in 
or any any news stories. Um, another interesting thing is we really got we're really getting a feel for how big this project is from Burnaby to where we are in Spruce Grove. We've been following the pipeline markers along the highway, and the markers have taken us down rural gravel roads to remote areas, down farmland, down backyards, through national parks, uh, past a lot of bodies of water. So we're really realizing how many people are affected and how much wildlife is also affected by the pipeline that's currently there. And Lucy, uh, what's, what's next on the agenda for you guys? So we have a story uh, that has yet to go to air that focuses on the Shuswap Nation, which is uh, a large swath of territory between Kamloops and the BC and Alberta border. We On Sunday, we happened to arrive uh, when there was this big anti-pipeline rally going on in the community. There are some First Nations that ha in that area that have signed mutual benefit agreements with Kinder Morgan, um, but we were able to get a, ri a wide range of opinions and perspectives from people because they came from all across this large territory. Uh, so that has yet to go to air, but uh, in the meantime, we just arrived in Alberta yesterday, so our plan is to talk to more people um, between here and uh, uh, east of Edmonton were the, the, the source of these protests, basically. Well, thank you both for taking the time to, out of your busy schedule to update us. Thank you. Thank you. Nation to Nation has made British Columbia its home this week. It's all in preparation for a special Western edition of the show, focusing on the Kinder Morgan pipeline controversy. To tell us more, we're joined by host Todd Lamarand. Welcome, Todd. Uh, Nation to Nation has been on the road. Why is that? Uh, thank you, Beverly. Uh, well, it's not because I couldn't get a good coffee in Ottawa. It's because we decided to come out here and go into the interior a bit, talk to a couple of First Nations who uh, have signed deals with uh, Kinder Morgan. We wanted to get away from the protesters and see what's happening on the ground in certain First Nations. So we went to one, and it's uh, the Upper Nicola, I'm sorry, the Lower Nicola First Nation, and they signed a conditional deal with Kinder Morgan. So if things work out uh, based on, I suppose, the conditions of their deal, they'll be getting a benefit agreement. And the reason that was given to us is uh, they just didn't want to be left out. They figure if this thing's going to be expanded through their territory, let's take advantage of it. And we've also talked to a chief of the Yale First Nation, and he fully supports the Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion. He, uh, at the direction of his, of his band members, he decided to sign a deal. And again, they want to get the benefits, uh, the long-term and short-term benefits. If it's pipeline jobs, so be it. But they're hoping for long-term benefits as well, whether it's constructing a community center or improving the band office. And what else will we see on Thursday's show? Well, we've got a constitutional expert we're talking to, and I'm not talking about any constitutional expert. This is the guy, Jack Woodward. He wrote the draft for Section 35 that's in the Constitution that gives Indigenous people uh, constitutional rights in this country. And uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, we've heard a lot about, uh, are we going through a constitutional crisis right now? He's going to give us uh, an answer that's probably contrary to a lot of politicians out there. Uh, and he thinks... Uh, really First Nations hold the hammer constitutionally on Kinder Morgan. Uh, if uh, they can get a judicial review uh, that uh, they weren't consulted enough uh, or com consultations weren't meaningful, then that's it. Uh, First Nations really could stop this project, one in particular, the Cold Water First Nation. So I expect uh, this constitutional, uh, Jack Woodward is the name, will give us uh, some of those answers. Well, great, Todd. Thanks for talking to us. Uh, we look forward to hearing more about this. Uh, thank you, Beverly. And again, that'll be on Nation and Nation right after the national news on Thursday. When we come back from the break, we'll find out more about a special project happening at Concordia University in Quebec to revitalize endangered Indigenous languages. But first, the rest of tomorrow's weather outlook. For Chippewan is sunny and plus 11, Peace River also sunny and plus 16. More sun in southern Alberta, 
Calgary and Medicine Hat, both plus 23. Campbell River is sunny and plus 22. Pen Penticton, a sunny plus 24. Some cloud cover in Smithers, plus 18. Sands Pit is also sunny and plus 11. Cloud covering much of the Yukon, plus 7 in Mayo, Beaver Creek, and Whitehorse. Norman Wells is a sunny plus 6, partly cloudy in Trout Lake, and plus 10. Cloud cover in Colville Lake, plus 2. Saks Harbor is sunny and minus 9. Sunny and minus 16 in Cambridge Bay, partly cloudy and minus 12 in Arviette. Snow and minus 15 in Clyde River, more snow in Pangerton and minus 4. Concordia University's journalist and resident Steve Bonsfield has a special project for two Mohawk communities. Since January, six students joined their efforts to find more about Ganya Gahaga, the Mohawk language and the people fighting for it. Daniel Rochette reports. Thank, thank you for your hospitality. Oh, what that's what it means. Steve Bonspiels is leading a group of six students who will build bridges with the Moa community's members, learn from them and give back. Go from knowing nothing about the language, nothing about our communities and, and getting into the communities and seeing the people and talking to them and doing the interviews and transcribing it. And now, you know, if you ask them, well, what, is, what, what does it mean, Geha? Well, you know, it's, it, it means a lot more than, than just that simple word. And behind the words are also people fighting for its survival. Hilda Nicholas says that there are only 60 speakers left in Kadastagi, and there is an urgent need for ongoing core funding to meet their needs. It is very important. I think it was, it's exciting for them to discover or really know the truth, what is really going on, because not everybody out there knows exactly what we go through. They don't know why the language is disappearing uh, and how difficult it is for us, for language and cultural centers to survive when there's no funding. Elder Arvi Setuwas Gabriel is passionate for his language. In 1999, he translated the Bible more recently, he published a second edition of a Moag dictionary. He had a message for the Concordia students who came to visit him. My identity is my language. And uh, w without the identity as connected to the language, you're nothing. Concordia student Kelsey Litwin is part of the project and is documenting a vital aspect of it. Within Steve Bontrier's class, I was working on the written portion of the project. Uh, specifically looking at um, the struggles that these different community groups face in terms of receiving funding for the work that they're doing in efforts to revitalize the language. Bonspiel has a lot of hope for this project. I hope that the project comes out and, and the community looks at it and said, says we can use this you know, to kind of to promote the language but to also learn ourselves and to teach people about who we are. The project will end in May and a website will be created to keep it alive. Daniel Rochette, APTN National News, Montreal. And that's your APTN National Newscast for this Wednesday. For more on these stories and to check out others, please visit us at aptn.ca or on our Facebook page. Thank you for joining us. I'm Beverly Andrews. Have a great evening.